I worked with an organist who for years wouldn't wear organ shoes, but she would wear these high heels. And as soon as she got to the organ, she would kick them off to the side. So on occasionally, just out of the meanness that is sometimes within me, I would grab her shoes <laughs> and move them a little further over so that when it was time for her to walk down from the organ, she either had to go without those shoes or she had to go looking for them. Her idea of fun was to take my notes and rearrange them <laughs> to see if when I started to talk, I really rely on them or not. And sometimes yes, sometimes no, but it was always fun just to have good time with the people that you work with. And at that point, I was working at this church part-time, so we would just have fun together. This week has not been fun, for the most part. How many of you are tired? It's all right. Most of us are. And most of us, interestingly, are tired not just from the hurricane, but because we stay busy 24 hours a day, seven days a week in our lives. We are constantly moving, constantly going, constantly doing something. Whether it's work or whether it's volunteer work, whatever it is, we're constantly moving around. And I have to be honest that I got kind of weary this week watching Mother Earth decide that she wanted to cleanse herself and that Florida was the part that needed cleansing. So I was tired. I was over it for part of the time. And I thought, you know, the energy, uh, the electricity at the house is going to go out. And I'm just going to sleep through all of this. And then I was blessed that my power never went out. So I sat up all night waiting to see what was going to happen next. Because I'm that kind of curious person and I don't do well with things that I don't understand. So I want the lights on either off where I can't control it or on, and then it's good. So that's kind of where I was when I was coming up with this talk. I had already decided on the topic, but I hadn't decided where to go with it necessarily. But the topic is called a blank canvas, grace. So when we talk about grace, I used the definition a moment ago, but my definition is a divine influence in our lives and its reflection in our daily life. So it's the divine working through us to send and to live grace for other people and for ourselves. And when I talk about grace, I'm always really excited because that's actually my mother's name. Her name was Mary Grace, and my grandmother, who was her mother's name, was Grace Marie. And I'm told, had I been female, I was going to be a Grace too. <laughs> so kind of grateful I wasn't. I liked the name I got. Uh, thankfully, they decided, though, not to go with some variation of that one, and they went with the other part of the family name, Henry, which is where the Hank comes from. But when I think of grace, I get to think of my mom and my grandmother. And when I think of what they showed me and the way they taught me and how they showed me how to live and how to serve others, that's a part of grace to me. And when I was studying for this talk, I came across a scripture in Luke 10 about two other women, Mary and Martha, who many of us have heard of. And in Luke 10, 38 through 42, it says, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at Jesus' feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Jesus answered, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is the better, and it will not be taken away from her. So how many of you know some Marthas in your life? Always busy, always trying to take care of everything, make sure everything works the way that they think it's supposed to, always doing things, and sometimes I get to be Martha. There are times in my life where I am so wrapped up in doing stuff, I forget what it was I was even doing the stuff for. I am one of those people who loves to plan a party and then loves to not go to it. <laughs> so you're going to learn a lot about me today. I'm just going to share some stuff that's out there. And that's the way that I am in a lot of ways. The introvert in me, by the time it's re you know, ready for the party to start, is going to retreat and go back into its little shell but I want the party to be a success. I want everything to be great. I want it to be the way it's supposed to be. And that's the way Martha was. But what Martha had forgotten was that she's a truth seeker. 
So she's looking for Jesus to teach her, but she became so busy with all the things that were going on that she missed that part. She was so busy making the details work that she forgot to listen to Jesus. And then she got ticked off because her sister Mary was doing just the opposite. I would never get ticked off about something like that, where I feel like I'm doing it all by myself and nobody's helping. I'm sure I'm the only one who ever gets that way, and that's okay. But when you get that way, then we have to remember, why was it we were doing this to start with? And for Mary and Martha, it was remembering that they were there to listen to Jesus talk and to hear his teachings and not to be doing all of this other stuff. So while Mary was in the present moment, Martha was worried about all the stuff going on around. Basically, Jesus said to her, Mary made the right choice. I came here to teach and to talk and to share with you, and you are worried about all the stuff. Let the stuff go. Listen to me. Listen to the stories I've come here to tell. Well, Martha wasn't very happy with that response, I'm sure, as I wouldn't have been. But she did finally stop. And if you continue with scripture and other uh, chapters and other verses, she did begin to listen to Jesus and to hear the lessons he was talking. So when you go back to our verse or our description, a divine influence in our lives and its reflection in our daily life, you come to grace. So as I thought about grace, I thought about all kinds of ways that I could understand it in my life. And the one that first came to mind was a blank canvas. That's grace. Every morning I get to wake up to a blank canvas. Nothing has to be on it. I can forget that which is behind me. I don't have to worry about what the future holds. I do both of those things. I continue to remember what happened yesterday and I thinking about what's going to happen sometimes on the next day. But what I need to do is focus on that blank canvas. There are a couple of artists in the room who can tell us what it's like to look at a blank canvas from a different viewpoint. I am not an artist. My brother is a brilliant artist. He makes his living actually doing art. He owns a company that now does billboards and things on sides of trucks and buses and all that kind of stuff. And that's his way of doing his art but he still paints. I can draw lovely stick figures. I didn't inherit any of that from my parents. He seems to have gotten all of it, and that's great. But when he looks at the canvas, he sees things totally differently than I do. He sees the potential in that canvas. So I'm trying to train myself as I work with grace to learn to see the potential in the canvas when I wake up every morning. What I have is a blank canvas that I get to start on. And I can paint it either with some bold colors or I can use black and whites and grays or I can use paint by number. (laughs) Some days that's where we are. Some days when I wake up, what I really want is for there to be numbers on that canvas so that I can just color in what's there. And I don't really have to give it a whole lot of thought. And I can even change what color goes in the number if I really want to be, you know, just give it a shot out there. So I paint by number and I do everything that it tells me to do and I go to work and I get off and I relax and I do my thing and I move on to what's next. But I don't think that's the way we were really intended to live. I think even though that'll make an okay looking picture, we were really intended to paint that canvas every day. So when we wake up and we have that grace to not worry about what's gone and not worry about what's coming, we get to paint what we see that day. We get to choose whether we're going to use, as I said, those bold colors and different brushes and different shading techniques to make something gorgeous of our day, or we get to choose to just leave it as a blank canvas. You can go through your whole day and leave that canvas blank, not putting anything on it that matters for the day. Some days when I wake up to that blank canvas, I'm really excited. I said I was going to share some about me. So if you don't know me well, you'll know that, or you may not know that one of the things that I'm very uncomfortable with is uncertainty. It drives me crazy. I like everything in its box, and I want it to fit there all the time, and I want it to move right along like it's supposed to every minute of every day. And when there's not some, or when there's a lot of uncertainty, it's kind of like that black cloud just hanging over me. It's the things that I worry about, the things that I 
uh, think about, I don't take a lot of risk. I'm one of those rule following kind of people, which is why I'm really good at the job I do, which is making sure everybody else at the university follows their rules. <laughs> Works for that. But sometimes in life, it doesn't work all that well. Sometimes in life, that's not the route you want to go. What you really want to do is to take out some bold colors of red and blue and yellow and green and slap them on that canvas and make something gorgeous. We have that opportunity every day. I have that chance, even when the days are there that I want to do paint by numbers, I can ignore that and do something bold on the canvas. I can take a chance and I can paint something very different and I can live in the moment now. Mark Twain said, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than the ones you do. So throw off your bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, and discover. That's the way we're meant to live life. We're meant to paint that canvas in a bold way, and we're meant to live with doing the things that we can discover is new and doing the things that we can dream about and that we can explore. This week, I encourage you to think about how you can do things in a more bold way, to step forward and live the dream that you have. Every one of us has a dream somewhere in our life. Live your dream. Some of you are. Congratulations. Some of us are still learning. We're getting there. Live the dream that you have. Step out forward in faith and try to paint your canvas in a different way. One of the other things I thought about when I was thinking about grace was how we get the opportunity to make mistakes and fix them. Any of you know Bob Ross, the painter guy on TV? Yeah, most of us have at least heard of him if we haven't watched him. If you ever watched one of his shows, while he was in the middle of painting, he would go, oops, there's a mistake. And then what did he do with the mistake? He painted it and blended it right in so it was a perfect part of the picture. We're going to make mistakes in our lives. We're going to have those opportunities that come that things don't go exactly the way we plan for them to. And the opportunity that we have is to then make it a part of our picture. If nothing else, what did I learn from this? What did I learn from this error, from this mistake that I've made? But one of the ways that we get to, to acknowledge those mistakes and we get to move forward from them is to take a pause. So this morning, the only thing I said that happened to me in the storm was a tree fell. Until this morning, when I got in my car and it would not crank. I don't know if water got toward the battery or something happened. But it's 15 till 10, and I'm getting in the car to come over here, and it's about a 40-minute ride. And I hit the thing, and it just goes, <laughs> was not a pretty sound. So being me, I thought, well, if I push it more, it'll work eventually, right? So I did. It didn't. So then I went inside, and I was all hyper and all excited. And I thought, dude, you're fixing to talk about a sacred pause. You might need to practice what you're preaching. <laughs> so I just calmed down, took a minute to breathe, take some deep breaths in, took some time out, and decided that I was going to borrow my roommate's car. So he sound asleep, so I yelled up to him and told him I was taking his car. And then I wrote him a note because I know he won't remember that he said okay when I yelled at him. Again, he was asleep. So he's still asleep. I take his car. I get here on time. And he's stuck with my car that doesn't work. Hope he didn't have any plans for the day. <laughs> and if he does, then I hope he knows where the charger is for my car. But we get to take that sacred pause every now and then. When life gets to be frustrating or it's something that doesn't fit us or all of our strategies aren't working for us and we're helpless and distraught and we start being frantic or frenetic, then we can just pause. Stop what we're doing and pause. Take a deep breath and look and see how we can move on to what's next. What is next for us in line? What is it that we need to be doing? And as we start to learn how to take those pauses, then we learn how to really listen to other people. Because sometimes when we're with people and they're talking, what we're doing is thinking of what we're going to say next and thinking of what they're going to say next and trying to predict and we start playing these games in our head where really what we need to be doing is listening. 
So we can take that sacred pause and we can just stop what we're doing and we can listen to the person that's talking to us. And sometimes we need to take long pauses. We call that meditation. So when I sit and I meditate, I try to block everything out of my head. And sometimes that doesn't work either because I start thinking about my grocery list and what I'm going to do later that day and what's coming up next. And meditation becomes just a regular daily activity that doesn't accomplish anything. So I learn how to pause again. Take that sacred pause and block out those things so that I can then meditate and spend time in the quietness. Sometimes we need to take retreats. We need to spend time in nature. Uh, Where I work, we can take sabbaticals after a certain number of years where we can just take an entire semester off. Now, granted, you do pay for your own semester off, but you do get to take the time. So we have the opportunity to just pause. And by nature, a pause means it's time limited. So while we can take that sacred pause, we know it's going to end. We know that we're going to be right back into whatever we were into. But the goal is for us to take that moment to be quiet and to think about what can I do with my blank canvas? How do I paint something new now? This didn't work out the way I thought it was going to. Maybe it's not going the way I expected it to. So let me pause and think about what's next. So when we awaken, we get to choose not only what we're going to paint, but we get to know that if we make a mistake or if there's something that's going on in our day, we can just pause. Take that pause. Take that moment. Breathe into it. Take the air into your body and allow yourself to calm down from the whirlwind that's often going on around us. Another definition I found of grace talked about it being like flowing water. I like that. When I was a young adult, I lived in middle Georgia, and there was a river right behind the house that I lived in. And we, a bunch of friends, and I would go play in the river every day during the summer. That was our way of letting go of our work day after it was over. We would all go out and get in the water. And one of the things I learned about the river is no matter where I started in that river, I never ended up there because the river moves. It's flowing. So I would end up a good ways from where I started. And I learned that one of the things that it didn't, didn't behoove me to do was to actually try to swim against that current because this was a strong river and you weren't going to make it. You learned how to go sideways instead of up and down. And I learned that there were ways that I could take care of myself in that river, but I also learned the power that that river has. And for me, that's also a part of grace. Because when we flow like the river, we flow like water, we go with the ebb and flow of life, then we can see grace working in our lives. The water moved obstacles out of the way. Now, recently, we've seen where water can be much more damaging. It moved things out of the way, like houses and people that we didn't wish for it to do. But that's also a part of that water. That's a part of what happens in life. And we have to be seeing the grace that comes in our lives. And during times like that, it's difficult to see. That's when we take that sacred pause and we breathe and we meditate. Reverend Darlene Strickland is the minister at Unity of Blue Ridge, which is in Asheville, North Carolina. She finally got power yesterday after Helene hit. Um, From her church, they had services last Sunday. The church got power back. People didn't, but the church did. So they all gathered together, people who had absolutely nothing left and people who did. And she was talking about this new word that she heard called guiltitude, which is a part of having a great attitude and having guilt at the same time. Gratitude, guilt. They go together sometimes. Guiltitude. And she was saying that sometimes it's difficult for her as a minister to say everything is fine and it's in God's plan and this is divine order and everything's going to work the way it's supposed to when really what you want to say is what the hell is going on here? And we get that way too. But we have to remember there's grace. Grace for us to live, grace for us to be, and grace for us to do the things that we need to do. And as Reverend Darlene explained and as that river taught me, Sometimes the water is there to cleanse and to move obstacles out of its way. 
and sometimes it's there to help you make your way because it will move those obstacles. And sometimes we have to decide where is it we are in this world. Are we going to meet the obstacles? Are we going to go over them, around them? How are we going to get through them? And it's grace that leads us through those obstacles. The divine working through us. The divine working as us. At Unity of Merritt Island, you've been in a time of change for a while. You've accomplished remarkable things. I'm excited when I look at your calendar and you have something every day. I am excited that you have a course of miracles back. I am excited that you're studying the 12 powers. It's exciting to see the work that you're doing in the community. But you're still in a state of flux as you look for your next minister. So I want you to think of grace as you're going through this process. Think of grace for your board members, for your selection committee. All of those who did all of that paperwork, goodness gracious, I've seen the paperwork you have to do to get a new minister with unity. That's a lot of work. So we say thank you to those of you who are in that. I invite you to show grace to your board members on a regular basis because that's a difficult job. But as you look for your next minister, Consider how do you want to paint that blank canvas? Who are you looking for? What do you want to put on that canvas? You have a blank canvas starting for you now. It's all ready. You just have to decide what colors and what brushes you're going to use, what way you're going to go, and when you're in a spot where you're stuck, you take that deep breath, take a sacred pause, and then you start to move forward again. And you move like the water. You ebb and flow depending on what's happening. And then I know that you're going to call the right person to be the next minister here. It just takes some time and some work. And I say thank you to those who are doing the work. Grace is a divine influence in our lives and its reflection in our daily life. Allow grace to work in your life. I want to end with a poem. It's called The Knot's Prayer. Any of you heard it before? Supposedly it was scribbled on a wall in a jail. And nobody knows who the author is, but it's called the Knot's Prayer. Dear God, please untie the knots that are in my mind, my heart, and my life. Remove the have-nots, the cannots, and the do-nots that I have in my mind. Erase the will-nots, may-nots, might-nots that might find a home in my heart. Release me from the could-nots, would-nots, and should-nots that obstruct my life. And most of all, dear God, I ask that you remove from my mind, my heart, and my life all of the am-nots that I have allowed to hold me back, especially the thought that I am not good enough. Amen. Amen. And so it is. Amen.